social entrepreneur means that you're a person of great belief and great faith. That you have to have a faith in humanity. You have to have a faith that this is going to be a better world. You have to have a faith in your fellow human beings that if you ask, they'll rise up and join you in doing good. And that faith is what propels you forward. And it is a rewarded faith because... It's from you at heart. It's, it's a challenge that you face day to day. And I feel like I am working to fiercely bring the right to a healthy environment, to consciousness, to policy, to practice on the planet. And we are on the down of a convergence of technology and spirituality. We all know that we're at a transition moment in the world. We can sense that. We all search for a common source of who we are and what the source of our happiness is. And I believe together we can actually achieve that and achieve a world that is a wonderful place for all of us to live. as opposed to a wonderful place for very few of us to live. People, they need to see in order to believe. They need to, to, to see with their own eyes how solutions can be brought about. Change starts with an idea, a vision, and then it starts to ripple through as you put the hard stuff in place. In the next 15 days or one month, you have to see there's another 10 seat toilet has been built. We see lots of people changing their behavior and new things happening because of what we've done. individuals, you know, having a different sense of themselves as a leader and the legacy that they can have personally in the world and through their business. Sometimes ordinary things that you see, you know, you don't pay attention to them. And those ordinary things actually hold a key to big problems. centuries from now people look back and say wow that was just amazing it made humanity better made 
our planet more sustainable. And I think that great ideas come from all different places and that the leadership and the next breakthroughs are going to come from people that we least expected them to be from. And that's why I think that we can say today with some conviction that a revolution is about to happen in the way that our societies deal with social issues. That a wave of social entrepreneurship will follow the wave of business entrepreneurship. It's not overly ambitious to think of a world where... The collective voice grows and grows to a point where it's tipping. Where, where every child goes to school, where every child gets education, where these young people will really be the next wave of leaders and social entrepreneurs. Where every life has equal value. Where we can communicate with each other to solve our problems together. Where we as human beings realize that we cannot consume the resources of the world the way we are doing. How do we build a world where that becomes the norm for everybody. If we believe and we continue and we know we're doing this from a good place. The impossible, all of a sudden, is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from the Said Business School, Stefan Chambers. Hello, friends, um, and welcome to Oxford, and welcome to the 12th Skoll World Forum. The sun is shining on my favorite week of the year. I am really, really, really delighted to see you. If you've been here before, welcome back. If this is your first Skoll World Forum, welcome home. I warn you, there will be music. <laughs> and there will be conversation. And there will be laughter. And there will be tears. And there will be dancing, though not by me. <laughs> this is our 12th Skull World Forum. We've moved over those dozen years from margin to mainstream. Where once we were a curiosity, we're now part of the international conversation. It's a testament to your work that we've moved so far, so fast. You come here from 60 countries, you touch millions of lives. Your work shows companies and countries that those motivated by meaning can be disciplined and inventive. That justice and opposing injustice are necessary everywhere and always. That ideas are powerful, and that progress is possible. That is an astonishing achievement. And we celebrate a very special anniversary this year. It's the 10th birthday of the Skoll Scholarship Program. Every year, remarkable social entrepreneurs are supported to come to the Said Business School to study for the Oxford MBA. They're selected not only for their brilliance and good looks, and I think you can see them behind me, <laughs> but for the contribution they will make to our project, this global endeavor to improve the world. I've been very fortunate to know them. Please join me in recognizing them tonight. And you have made it to Oxford. 
past the building works and whichever indignities of travel you suffered to arrive here. And here this week, you are in the best, the most supportive place in the world for social entrepreneurs. Here, what you do is celebrated, supported, and endorsed. Welcome. So, our theme this year is belief. And belief is complex, and it is everywhere. And sometimes it's a synonym for faith, and sometimes for rationality, and sometimes it's metaphysical, and sometimes it isn't. In all of those cases, believing is a mysterious business. We can believe true things. We can believe false things. We can believe in things we know to exist and in things we wish existed. We elide belief, knowledge, doubt, faith, hope. We move between believing in and believing that without a pause. And belief is always necessarily twinned with its more skeptical sibling, doubt. As Paul Tillich wrote, doubt isn't the opposite of belief. It is an element of belief. And belief allows us to describe the world as it is, but also as it ought to be. It's the glue that unites people around ideas. It's the fuel for movements. But it matters as much what we believe that we believe. You believe in each other and in the scope for a positive future, in the reality of social justice and the reality of love. You believe that those things are possible. And like Alice, we can all believe six impossible things before breakfast. And sometimes it's precisely those beliefs before breakfast, our belief in the seemingly impossible, the hopelessly idealistic, the transformative and revolutionary, Sometimes it is exactly that that nudges us towards justice and impels us to improve the world. As I said, belief is mysterious. Philosophers tell us that knowledge is justified true belief. You are creating knowledge here this week. You're converting intuition and conviction and judgment into a body of work. You are creating justified, true belief. And now, and now for something very slightly less mysterious. We're used to speeches and panels and performance and convenings. And we'd like to add something to our forum tonight. We'd like to add the idea of conversation, the idea of discursive revelation, of what it means to believe in a collective future as it emerges from a conversation. And we are enormously fortunate that the founder of this remarkable enterprise and the reason we are all here tonight and this week has agreed to discuss his beliefs with us in, purpose, in public. I know that he believes in you. I know that he believes in good people doing good things. He really is a good person doing good things. Asking the questions will be Mabel Van Oranje, well known to you all as the chair of Girls Not Brides. It is my enormous pleasure to introduce to you tonight Mabel and Jeff. Thank you. 
Good evening. Um, School World Forum 2015, believe, we have seen it, Jeff. And I'm incredibly happy that we have a, a moment together to unpack a little bit what you personally believe in, but I would also like to explore what you believe that you can do with your life to make a difference in the world. Let us start with your personal belief. Um, as was already said, for some, belief, personal belief relates to religion. For others, it relates to, to ethics, to a sense of right and wrong, to, to fairness, justice. And um, I would love to know, would you describe yourself as being religious? Thank you, Mabel. And uh, <laughs> the uh, first thing I'd like to say is uh, I believe in all of you. I'm, I'm so excited uh, to be here uh, at our 12th annual School World Forum. Um, you'll hear the recurring theme of social entrepreneurs as, as heroes. Um, I wanted to welcome three special guests uh, who are here for the first time at the School World Forum. Uh, two of them share my last name. I'd like to welcome my parents, Mort and Judy Skoll. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reality, the, the reality is they, they, they started the foundation, and I've just been the front person for it all these years. Uh, welcome, Mom and Dad. They'll be married 57 years uh, this year. So glad to have you. Um, and, and speaking of uh, marriage, I'm happy to welcome my wife, uh, Stephanie Swedlove. <laughs> and I, I, I can't stop there. Uh, Stephanie's mother, Wendy Swedlove, my mother-in-law, is also here for the first time. <laughs> so, Mabel, back, back to your question. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I, think, um, I think belief is indeed, as Stefan said, it's a, it's a complicated uh, subject. And I, I truly believe that we're, we're all interconnected and that there is a, a, a greater force that's greater mm. than all of us. And e even in this room, uh, there's so much positive energy. There's so many wonderful people doing great things in the world. And I don't know about you, but I feel that. I feel inspired. And connecting to that energy and knowing that there is this greater force that we can connect to through whatever religion it may be, uh, I think is incredibly powerful. And um, I, I think there are many ways to connect to that, uh, to that mm -hmm. belief. Um, uh, and I, I think the, the, you know, there are there are different philosophies, there are different belief systems, and I think the only belief system that is, 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 is wrong is the one that says that there's this, that, that's the only way to connect mm -hmm. to this greater being. Yeah. You mentioned that, that Judy and, and Mort, your parents, are here. I'm very curious to know, what do you think is one of the most valuable things that they told you? And we'll check it maybe <laughs> later with them. Huh? <laughs> Ah, uh, mom and dad. Well, um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're the products of our, our families and our environments. And, um, you know, if, if you've heard me tell uh, bad jokes, and I may pop a few in during the course of this, uh, this interview, uh, I get that from my dad. <laughs> and uh, the good sense to actually not tell those jokes, I get that from my mom. But, uh, you know, I, my parents are just the nicest people in the world, have great values, and uh, I, th I think growing up with that g gives a person a, a sense of self mm -hmm. and a sense of uh, their place in the world. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I'd love to ask that, that question of you, but uh, you're... Another time. M M Mabel has... Uh, <laughs> M Mabel has, So y yesterday we did a, a, a brief Q&A with the social entrepreneurs, and it was about an hour long, and Mabel said, we don't have an hour. You have to be crisper on your answers. 
or I'll cut you off. Or you'll cut me off. <laughs> exactly. Um, Jeff, it's a big year, important year. You turned 50, you got married. What is actually quite odd, I thought, is that there is a happy birthday song, there isn't a happy marriage song, happy marriage song, but so maybe we can invent something another time. <laughs> I remember when Sally Osberg told me for the first time about Stephanie. And she said, you will like her, Mabel. She shares the same values as Jeff. Mm. Now, I'm very curious how you would describe the values that Stephanie and you believe in. Hmm. Yeah, th these are very uh, <laughs> personal <laughs> questions. Well, you know, I, I, um, you know it's funny, I, 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 when, when you grow up, uh, mm -hmm. You are uh, accustomed to a certain way of, of living and being and treating people. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a middle class background in Canada, and uh, life has changed over the last 15 years. Um, uh, you know, uh, after, after eBay and starting the foundation and going to Hollywood and all, all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, you're still that same person that you grew up being. And, um, Stephanie uh, grew up in a very similar environment, uh, Canadian and um, middle class, and our and, and we're both uh, we're both Jewish, um, and uh, you know our, our our ancestors came over on the same boats pretty much from uh, from Europe, uh, sort of be, you know, between the wars, and so you know there, there's something when you when you find somebody that uh, you you connect with and your value systems are are aligned. Uh, that, that you find really wonderful. And then the love helps, of course. The love, the lo the love helps, <laughs> yes. Um, right, honey? <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, um, belief also relates to what, what we think we can do with our lives. Mm. And as a philanthropist, you obviously believe in, in the concept of human progress. Now, many of us know and have you heard you talk about uh, that as a kid you wanted to, to be a storyteller, mm. uh, hoping that your stories would have a positive impact on the world. This suggests that already at a fairly young age, you, you had a sense of that the world wasn't necessarily perfect and could be improved. And, and I quite vividly remember for myself growing up in a middle class family in the Netherlands, mm. when I was quite young, the moment I realized that actually all these things I took for granted, education, schooling, uh, uh, food, that that was actually quite unique and that there were a lot of people who didn't have the same privileges. And so I'm wondering, did you in your youth, or, or maybe later, have that moment where you really realized, do you remember that moment for like, the world isn't perfect and, and mm. that you thought, okay, and this is what I'm gonna do about it to make it a better mm. place. Mm, yeah, so I, I, I mean, for me as a, as, as a kid, uh, growing up, uh, I, I read a lot of books, and a lot, a lot of books, you know, it's either historical fiction or mm -hmm. books about the future or the potential future. Um, 1984, um, Brave New World, uh, Animal Farm, th th things like that. And, and I remember thinking that by the time I was older, by the time I had kids, the world might not be as pleasant a place. Mm -hmm. And I, I, just, I thought I, I would be a storyteller and try to tell stories about the big issues that affect us all and uh, would, would try to get people involved through the, through the power of storytelling. <laughs> now that said, it was all, it was all very academic. Um, my family never really traveled much when I was younger. And when I graduated college, I, I was 20 years old, uh, had never been on a plane, Mm -hmm. and decided to backpack around the world. And for, for a kid that hadn't seen much of the world, uh, that was very eye-opening. I mean, you know, Canada's a prosperous place and it's very egalitarian and you don't, you don't see as much hardship and poverty and so on. And I remember kind of making my way and uh, I, 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 think, I think, you know, of all places, um, you know, there are probably two that stand out, uh, Sudan and Pakistan as places where uh, I saw people living in the most desperate circumstances, and, and particularly uh, Pakistan, uh, just, just affected me. It was, yeah. I mean, th this is going back 20 plus years, but uh, the, there were folks living in the most desperate conditions without healthcare and air so thick you couldn't breathe, and 
you know, fundamentalist religion and not a lot of hope and uh, nuclear weapons. And I remember thinking, um, the world can't, can't have something like this exist. Um, and from that moment on, I, I was compelled uh, to want to make the world a better place so that everybody could live in a sustainable world of peace and prosperity. Everybody should have access to education. Everybody should have health care and live in peace. And um, you know, so I'd gone from the, the books, uh, reading as a kid, to actually seeing it in real life. And that, that really set me on a mission. And once you got off on that mission, um, at some point I got to know you. And, and I think um, I know you as someone who really likes to take the plunge. <laughs> and um, you're not afraid to tackle major problems and, and you know, basically take enormous risks. Um, we also know that with success, there's always failure. That's part of it. Progress requires learning. Could you share with us when in your life you've been proven wrong? Well, it, you know, I, I laughed when Mabel said, uh, take the plunge. Uh, you know, uh, Mabel was uh, CEO of the Elders uh, for many years, and uh, the Elders is a wonderful organization. We'll talk a bit about that, I hope, in, in a moment. Uh, we were in Morocco at an Elders meeting, and Mabel uh, challenged me to uh, jump in the, uh, the pool with her uh, so we, we took the plunge together, and uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I remember uh, President Carter sort of just shaking his head and walking away. And, uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, back to back to the question, uh, proven wrong. Um, <laughs> um, you know, they, they, they say no matter what the question, you should always know what you're going to say and <laughs> say it anyway. Um, uh, well, I, I, I think. Um, I think there, there, there's, there's something that uh, we grow up with or we are accustomed to in mm -hmm. society where we're told uh, you can't trust people, you can't trust your neighbor. Uh, you read the newspapers and there are headlines that things are bad and things are getting worse. Um, but the reality is um, people are basically good. And if you give good people the opportunity, they'll do good things. Uh, I remember when Pierre and I uh, first got together, and uh, Pierre had this idea for eBay. And you know, in the early days, uh, there was a moment where somebody had to trust that some stranger uh, would have an item that they described online, and that they would send this person some money, and that this person was going to send this item, and that it would be as described. And uh, folks said, uh, no, you can't, you can't trust people. And we were like, no, no, actually, you, you can. People are, are, are trustworthy. Um, and uh, you know, here it is many years later, and uh, you know, mm. e eBay's still around, so I guess Pierre, Pierre was right. <laughs> um, but you know, that, that philosophy that people, is ba people are basically good is, is something that all, all, all of you in this room share, uh, or, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, I, I remember, and cut me off if you want to, Mabel. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm going to say that. No, look, everybody wants to hear how you're going to admire them, so go on, go on a little bit. I mean, otherwise. Um, in, in the very early days, so uh, eBay had gone public, and uh, we had started the eBay Foundation, which I ran, and very soon after started um, what was then called the School Community Fund, mm -hmm. which I ran part time. Uh, while still at eBay, and uh, a few years later, um, started uh, you know decided that now's the time to really focus on a foundation and build it, and brought in the incredible Sally Osberg as CEO and employee number one. <laughs> and Sally took me to meet her mentor, uh, John Gardner, mm -hmm. who. Uh, was the Minister for Health, Education, and Welfare under Lyndon Johnson, and the architect of the Great Society programs in the United States in the 1960s. And we asked John, what could we do uh, to best ensure the survival of humanity into the future? And John said, bet on good people doing good things. Um, 
and when we talked about that more, he, he felt that there were al always going to be problems in society, but there would be people who would stop at nothing mm -hmm. to solve these problems and would dedicate their lives to, to, to uh, making a difference. And uh, just around that time, uh, the term social entrepreneurship began to be known. Mm -hmm. And we felt that there was a, an incredible opportunity to help this field of entrepreneurs in the nonprofit sector uh, get going. Um, Bill Drayton, who I, I, I believe is here, um, you know, sort of coined the term social entrepreneurship. But here we are, all these years later, betting on good people doing good things. And I'd never answered your question about how I've been proven wrong. Exactly, Isn't that you great? did very well, very well. <laughs> but I do want you to, to respond to the next one, which is, so we have a room <laughs> full of social entrepreneurs and leaders. What are the qualities for good leadership? And can you actually learn it? Can they actually teach it? I mean, I guess you think so, because otherwise you wouldn't have built that enormous school there. Or is it something more that comes with experience? Mm. Um, I, Le leadership is an interesting thing, and I've, I've learned more and more over time uh, about what makes a great leader. And I, I think the first thing is a, a, a moral compass, mm -hmm. um, an ethical direction of knowing right from wrong. Uh, second is a belief that you can accomplish something and rally people earnestly around whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, so you're not putting on an, on an act. Uh, you're, you're, you're actually, um, you, you believe in something and uh, it's profoundly impactful on you and you can naturally uh, discuss this and, and get other people uh, involved. Um, Noah Manduk is here and he's a, you know, a branding expert and he says, you know, brand is about being yourself on purpose. I think great mm -hmm. leaders, um, are great leaders because they are themselves, they know what their purpose is, and they're, they're dedicated to it. Um, stamina. Uh, mm -hmm. We mentioned the elders, and uh, we've been so lucky to work with incredible mm -hmm. elders, uh, such as uh, um, Kofi Annan, and President Carter, and Archbishop Tutu, and uh, Grasa Michelle, um, many of whom have, have graced the forum over the years, and we've traveled the world with, with the, these folks. And President Carter uh, turned uh, 90 uh, yeah. last year, and he runs rings around all of us. Uh, and and that, that made me wonder, well, first, you know, how, what was he like when he was uh, a younger uh, man? <laughs> um, but stamina, just stamina, hard work, good values, purpose, knowing what you're doing, all those qualities are, are the hallmarks of, of, of great leaders. And I'm sure I'm forgetting um, a whole bunch, but uh, you're a great leader, Mabel. What do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, today I don't talk, oh, I only dear. ask questions. <laughs> um, but no, you're referring to the elders, and I'm actually curious. So that's where, where we met each other seven years ago and, and we've seen them doing amazing work and we've also been privy to, to their conversations about how they look at the world and, and what they think they can change. And if you look back at, at you know, basically spending time and being educated by the elders, what, what are the things that, that you feel you have learned from them, either collectively or, or maybe from some of them individually? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start by going back and, and, mm -hmm. and just saying that over uh, the course of my lifetime, I've been privileged to come across incredible leaders in, in all fields, uh, in, you know, teachers, uh, in, 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 in schools, um, uh, my, 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 my family, um, uh, business leaders, mm -hmm. uh, you know, start, starting eBay was an incredible opportunity to be around incredible, incredibly wise people. Pier Piero Midiar, for those that don't know him, is, is one of the wisest people I've ever met. And I think when we first started uh, eBay, Pierre was you know, in his late 20s. So I, I, don't, I don't think wisdom is a function of age. It's a function mm -hmm. of some uh, a, a other quality. Um, and then, and then again, you know, over time, have have met incredible, uh, dynamic, impressive leaders. 
and, and especially in, in this world, uh, people that are dedicated to a cause, to um, making, you know, make, making sure that the planet is, is livable for our future generations, uh, protecting the forests, um, being on the front lines. Uh, you know, every year I see um, Karatulain Bakhtiri of Pakistan and Sakina Yakubi of Afghanistan. These are not elders. I asked you about the no, elders. No, I'm coming yes. back to that. Don't, oh, don't, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, uh, the, these are, you know, leaders mm -hmm. who uh, every year um, are so impressive by their experiences, what they've learned, and, um, ha you know, the, the challenges that they have of leading their organizations mm -hmm. and educating millions of girls and, you know, uh, et cetera. The elders collectively as a group uh, has been an incredible experience. Uh, I, I, I was lucky enough to come along early, early on when the group was just being formed and uh, individually, each of the elders um, are incredible uh, people in, in their own right. Um, together, uh, it, it, it's, it's like an exponential uh, value. Uh, and and you, you, you know, some of the elders are from Africa, some are from South America, some are from the, uh, Europe, uh, some are from America, and uh, you know, all of them are global citizens. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it, it's, it's so impressive to have a conversation about UN reform with mm -hmm. uh, Kofi Annan in the room, or about faith and belief with uh, Archbishop Tutu in the room, um, or, or, or about um, the Middle East with, uh, with, with President Carter and Lakhdar Brahimi, um, uh, Africa and the rise of, of Africa and making a difference with uh, uh, Miss Michelle and uh, Arch and, and, and others, um, and, and it's sort of, uh, you know, I, I wish we could clone uh, the elders and um, transfer those lessons so that everybody in the world can, can see what we've been so privileged mm -hmm. to see, how the leading moral icons of, of our time uh, are human beings mm -hmm. and have um, you know just these these lessons for for us all? If if, if the world was composed uh, entirely of, of elders, as as we know them, uh, the world would be a much better place. I agree, and I think one of the things that's that really is special about them is that they all are, despite all their amazing achievements, they have remained humble and and human. Um, I'm really curious and. <laughs> I mean, I've been dying in a way to ask you this question for seven years. Who's your favorite elder? <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget, Arch and Grosso Michelle and Mary Robinson are in the room, so. Oh, Mary is here. Hello, Mary. Um, I think she is here. Is she, anyway. Well, um, honestly, uh, I mean, all of the elders are absolutely <laughs> incredible. And, uh, you shall know, I... I, I, I shall I, I do I, a follow-up question? I, I mean that, um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, t together, uh, you know, some of us have been to the Middle East, and uh, participant had a project on nuclear weapons at one point, and um, Gru Brundtland uh, was a big part of helping us with with that, and um, um, uh, just uh, you know, a, 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 a long long story short, all of the elders are involved in so many of the world's biggest issues. Uh, Mary, obviously, now on climate change and also on uh, girls' rights and women's rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, collectively, um, th no. they're all my favorites. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I must say I was always uh, impressed how Archbishop Tutu could, as the chair, could manage that, that group of people who are hard to manage. But obviously, he could threaten with the fact that if they didn't behave, they would go to the hotter place <laughs> later on. So. <laughs> Um, let's talk a tiny bit about, about girls and women, because um, I, I know that's an issue you, you are, are very passionate about. Um, it's obviously not something that fits in the global threats category of your work. It's more a, you know, a global opportunity. Um, I mean, you've been supporting films in this field. You, you have, there are tonnes of, of female social entrepreneurs here. I know you're working now on, on a project that is really close to your heart, which is um, 
it's, you know, Malala was here last year. Since mm. then, she got uh, the Nobel Prize. And now you are producing uh, a film about Malala's life. What are you expecting from that film? Mm. Yeah, uh, many, uh, many, many dimensions to, to that question. I mean, for, first off, um, W w women's rights in, in, in general uh, are, to, to, to my mind, countries that have uh, gender equality uh, are, are, are the best off countries in the world. Um, you know, and Sa Sally ha has been leading uh, uh, something called the Social Progress Indicator and the Social Progress Index uh, for many years with um, Michael Porter and, and others. And, uh, the, the SPI has come out with its rankings for the last uh, couple of years. And the countries that, and by the way, the, the social progress indicator is sort of everything other than GDP. So it sort of takes that out of the, the equation. It's how many doctors are there in the population and how uh, well off are people, longevity, women's uh, more, uh, 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 childbirth uh, statistics, things like that. And generally, uh, countries that are, are gender balanced are, are much better off than anywhere else. Um, many of the uh, social entrepreneurs in, in this room uh, deal, deal with human rights and many with education. And to, uh, in, in, including, including your, yourself, uh, Mabel, um, with Girls Not Brides. And I think if there is a silver bullet in the developing world, uh, it's girls' education. Um, when girls are educated, uh, they, they get married later. Uh, they educate their children. They can provide for their family. Uh, they, they have fewer children and they're healthier families. Their societies are better off. And, it, it, you know, it's an incredible thing. And you mentioned uh, urgent threats. Well, yeah, we, you know, we are working on these, you know, giant global threats like climate change and nuclear weapons and pandemics and so on. But we're going to get through those. But when we do, in the long term, we want to have a world that's fair and sustainable and equitable and great and a pleasure for everyone to live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, girls' education, I think, is one of those incredible opportunities that is right in, in, our, in our laps. And last year, Malala uh, uh, gave a, an incredible uh, keynote presentation. Um, for those of you who were here, it, w it was it's kind of uh, interesting. I think Malala was 16 at the time, and uh, she had uh, she had her her notes uh, written in crayon, and <laughs> and uh, she delivered just one of the most incredible, uh, wise, uh, engaging talks that we've ever had here at the forum. And Malala is the face of this movement mm -hmm. of girls' education. And you know, when I look around the room. Um, uh, and I see people like Ann Cotton and CampFed who educate uh, two million girls, and one of our new awardees, Educate Girls in India, and uh, the Citizen Foundation in Pakistan, and IDSP in Pakistan, and the Afghan Institute of Learning in Afghanistan, and I, I can go on and on, Free the Children, sort of uh, Africa, Latin America, uh, India, and so on. Um, this, the social entrepreneurs in this room touch hundreds of millions of kids yeah. in the developing world. And I think collectively, we have an opportunity uh, with Malala as the face of this movement uh, to make a difference. So, um, Davis Guggenheim, uh, who directed An Inconvenient Truth, and uh, uh, Waiting for Superman, which was a documentary about the American education system, um, has directed a film on Malala, mm -hmm. um, which we are, we participants are, are producing, and we're trying to create the world's greatest campaign around girls' education that uh, the world has ever seen, and, and the moment is now, and we're, we're very excited about it. I think time has come. It's okay. great. And like you say, you have a. You have a room full of people who can help create that movement. Mm. And this is the time, so let's, let's do it. I have a final question. And um, I mean, I have a million other questions, but we'll do that maybe the next time. But 
The one I would like to know now is, if you were to have a daughter, what would you want for her? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Stephanie. <laughs> Well, yes, first I would uh, consult with my wife <laughs> and ask, uh, well, uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, I think a, a universal human uh, value is uh, parents want their children to grow up in a better world than they experienced. And I, uh, Stephanie and I have been privileged to grow up in a pretty good world. Um, we, would, we would love our, our, our daughter uh, to grow up in a uh, better world than, than we've seen. Um, fairer, equitable, more peaceful, more sustainable, um, more, um, uh, more, more, more balanced. Um, and uh, just, uh, you know, the, we're, we're, at, we're at the turning point in the world. You know, it's sort of, there's been a, a race between these critical problems and these good people doing good things. And we're finally at that nexus where I, I think we're going to change the trajectory. Um, we're going to have a, a clean energy global in infrastructure within 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that's going to solve water problems and help alleviate extreme poverty and uh, solve food dilemmas and uh, solve a lot of the health problems that we're going to have, the breakthroughs in health. I, I mean, 15 years from now, I think we're going to be able to reverse aging. Um, the world is going to be an incredibly wonderful place. And for our daughter, uh, Stephanie and I would love our daughter to have uh, a wonderful, long, long life uh, with every opportunity in the world. And we would wish the same for every other parents, daughters uh, worldwide. You know, Jeff, you unite us all. You inspire us all. And please, Stephanie and Jeff, know that we will do everything, all of us here together, to make sure that your daughter will grow up in that world that you would like her to live in. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Mabel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yes. Thank you. Thank you. How fortunate, uh, how fortunate we are. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before our next conversation, um, it's my great privilege to introduce one of the founding figures of our movement, who will address us first herself and then go on to run our next conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Jacqueline Novogratz of Acumen. Thank you, Stefan. Belief. The word is a provocation. Belief moors us. It makes us human. As social entrepreneurs, belief fuels us to believe in the seemingly impossible and sometimes make it happen. And yet belief can also distance us, harden us to each other and possibility and sometimes do terrible things. And so it's a great privilege to be asked to reflect for a few minutes on belief, for it's something I've wrestled with for most of my life, as I imagine have so many of you. We're born and given and inherit systems of beliefs as children. I was born into a large Catholic immigrant military family, and so was raised in a belief system grounded in God, love, community, duty, work. And I remember in being in first grade when my teacher, an 80-year-old nun, bespectacled, put a, a poster on the wall of two hands holding an empty rice bowl, a reminder to give alms and be generous. And I spent a lot of time reading stories of the saints. And it was only recently that the wonderful poet Marie Howe uh, suggested to me that 
Maybe the saints were the only women we read about who were the subjects of their own lives. And that, indeed, they were the first individuals I was introduced to who were willing to live and, if necessary, die for an idea. And so I started to think about what idea was I willing to live for. And I found that answer in Rwanda in the mid-1980s, where I had gone to help start a microfinance bank, and discovered that it was not alms that interested me as much as agency, and that the idea for which I was ready to live was dignity, human dignity. This idea that, as humans, we yearn for choice and opportunity, for freedom from want and fear, freedom to bring our best selves to the world. And I thought the world would, would celebrate our successes. And that was a naive belief. For soon after starting, I was confronted by a local minister who said that no woman from his parish could borrow from us because usury was prohibited, was forbidden in the Bible. And no matter how much I would protest, that the 12% annual interest that we charged the women was in no way comparable to the 10% daily interest they paid the money lenders, he would not be moved. And so I had to confront the fact that often these moral authorities that I had been raised to respect were also the guardians of the status quo that promoted and defended dependency, which is the opposite of dignity. And I learned, expanding my beliefs, that it is only justice, not charity, that will end poverty. And that if I was going to be effective in fighting for that, I better learn to get comfortable being uncomfortable. 30 years later, belief as a provocation, I am still fueled by this idea that it is only when we all have dignity as a human race that any of us can have dignity. And when I think about um, what that means for the world. It's really this sense of, um, of, of, of needing to go back to where we started. And in many ways, when Sally asked me to go on this journey and reflect about belief, I thought it was really about looking at the religious beliefs primarily that my family had given me. But in fact, it wasn't only that. It related to the work and that the same framework of the beliefs that we start with, and as social entrepreneurs, all of us build companies and organizations based on a set of frameworks and beliefs. Look at those original beliefs and decide which ones we carry forward, which ones have the beauty to make change in the world, and which ones we must jettison. And so I stand here and challenge you with the same challenge I would give to myself and to the organization that I started 14 years ago. For the world has changed. It has become more complex and interdependent, and we have changed. Our organizations have changed. And so as we look at this world that is full of both peril and unprecedented opportunity, what are those beliefs that make us most beautiful, that allow us to bring our best selves into the future, and which are the ones that might now hold us back and make us less relevant? Because the opportunity for us is to be bold and audacious to a world that is waiting for us to bring solutions. And so my challenge continues not only to you around the, the, the belief, the idea for which you are willing to live. For me, it is dignity but for the beliefs that you will carry forward and those that you will jet jettison. And the Skoll Forum has given us this extraordinary provocation to spend the next couple of days together thinking individually and collectively around what we believe individually and that set of values that we can find and share together. For that is when we can really change the world. So thank you, Sally. Thank you, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you around belief. Thanks. So I'm 
beyond delighted to invite four extraordinary individuals, each of them moral leaders in their own right, to have a real conversation about belief with the same notion of what is fixed, what is fluid, what do we bring forward, what must we leave behind. Zach, Ibrahim, I didn't realize you were coming out one at a time. <laughs> whose story is amazing, painful, provocative. Um, when Zach was seven, his father um, assassinated a, um, a very famous rabbi. And when he was 12, his father, who was in prison at the time, um, helped plan the, bombing, the first bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993. And there came a moment when Zach made the incredibly painful decision to reject both his father's ideology and his father, and spent his life working for peace and reconciliation and speaking out against terrorism. And the Archbishop Desmond Tutu needs no introduction whatsoever. Not in this group. Sally said it last night. He is the father to all of us. Archbishop Tutu is a global treasure, for he's one of the few moral leaders in our world in whom each of us can see ourselves and continues to be an inspiration through these decades of a life lived in ways that we could only hope and aspire. And seated next to Archbishop Tutu is his daughter, the Reverend Mpo Tutu. And uh, Mpo told me last night that it was Archbishop Tutu who priested her, or who ordained her. And she is not only a minister, but she is also an activist, a speaker, a writer, and I understand an extraordinary daughter. And finally, Ophelia Dahl, who grew up in a family of incredible storytellers. Um, and what I was thinking about, when I was thinking about you, Ophelia, is that this is a woman who brings moral imagination not only through the spoken and written word, what she does extraordinary well, but she lives the moral imagination in her work as an advocate and a practitioner of public health the Executive Director of Partners in Health. And it's an honor to have all four of you uh, here to share this conversation. And so if I may, because there is no one I could start with except for you, Archbishop Tutu, um, start with a quote that you actually wrote in your um, incredible book, God is Not a Christian, which in and of itself is a provocation. You said, life is more exhilarating as you try to work out the implications of your, of your faith rather than living by rote. With ready-made secondhand answers, fitting an unchanging paradigm to a shifting, changing, perplexing, and yet fascinating world. Belief often go hand in hand, as you were saying last night. But how do we navigate a faith that is fluid rather than fixed? And in your decades on Earth, seeing so much how have you navigated that? What have you brought forward from what your parents and your original community gave you and the world we live in today? First of all, may I just say what a very great privilege it is to be here. Uh, it's a fantastic place. And uh, I mean, just listening to Mabel and Jeff, uh, is such an exhilarating experience. Um, what was your question? <laughs> it's perfection. <clears throat> the three Fs, the idea of faith as fluid, where we change and faith as fixed. I have, I have been greatly blessed by 
the people that have influenced me and yes i i think all of us in here would say that we don't learn by rote um as it were, the the best book as it were is these fantastic people i i grew up in a society that um uh, told black people that they didn't count for very much and i had a mother who was not very educated um and i resemble her uh physically she she was stumpy <laughs> and had a, a large nose <laughs> but she was uh, just amazing in in her generosity mm. in her compassion in in her caringness and i said i hope i might be able to emulate her and i i have met others along the way in 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 in, in south africa i i mean i've i've said I've told this story once or so. <laughs> I was standing with my mom. She was a domestic worker uh, at a at a at a, a hostel for blind <coughs> black women. And a tall figure in a cassock swept past hmm. and a white priest doffed his hat to my mother i a white man doffing his hat to my mother a black woman I didn't think that that had affected me. But I discovered that more than any other thing <clears throat> it 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 actually yes made me believe what we kept being told that we are all equal because this person came to have an incredible um influence on my life Trevor Huddleston uh, I don't know that many people might know him but he was a a monk I think uh, <laughs> South Africa was saved from a blood bath a racial blood bath in part because of his influence on so many he was a great friend of Nelson Mandela's and Oliver Tambo and so on um yeah i don't think that um, any one of us has a life that is not buttressed by beliefs even when we do not necessarily acknowledge them it is it is that when you come to believe that you count 
you have a worth that is inestimable, that you are a God carrier, that, that there is nothing that anyone can do mm. ultimately. I should shut up. Archbishop Tutu, the, in um, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, he talks about nobodies and somebodies. And uh, listening to you about this moment when you realize that you are worthy, someone beautiful, makes me just wonder if there was ever a time in your life where you felt like a nobody, or if for whatever reason, your parents, Reverend Huddleston, you always felt like a somebody. Where did you get the confidence to fight and to stand for these beliefs? I'm sure that there, are, there were very, very many moments when living in a segregated ghetto, uh, <laughs> you, and, and you had schools that were really church buildings, no desks, you sat on the pews. But many times, I mean, you, you, you wondered whether you were not God's stepchild. Mm. Um, but it was, it, yeah. I mean, one does, mustn't make out that there were not many times when you, you would cry um, because of the treatment that was meted out to you. I, at about the age of seven or so, I, I, I went with my father into a shop. My father was headmaster of a, of a school. And so in the black community, my father was a somebody. <laughs> um, and we go into the shop, and a slip of a girl, a white girl, says, addressing my father, yes, boy. Mm. And I wondered how my father felt. And then, as if God wanted me to experience something similar, I, we went to England. Uh, uh, I came here to study at King's, the other King's, not the King's, uh, King's London. Um, and Paul was born in London. And so she, she was used to, I mean, almost all of her friends um, were white kids, and she played with them. And we were walking with her. <clears throat> And she saw some children in a playground and, and, and said uh, she wanted to go on the, on the swings. They said, no, darling, you can't. Uh, you can't go. Um, uh, and she, she said, uh, she was about three or four. She said, but there are other children playing. <laughs> And I realized then, how do you tell your child that you are a child, but not quite a child like those other children? Mm. And, and so it was as if God was answering me. Well, do you know how you're feeling? Like when you want the earth to open up and, and swallow you. You wanted to know how your dad was feeling. That's how we are feeling. Thank you. Paul, you were raised by one of the 
most extraordinary people who've ever lived on this planet. Uh, you not only have inherited beliefs from both parents, but a sense of who you are from them. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you've been given, what you were raised with, and how you are also changing and bringing your own sense of the world and our future in it. What has had to change for you? Um, well, I first I have to agree with you. My mom is one of the most extraordinary people on the planet. <laughs> Not to take it away. <laughs> My dad's nice too. <laughs> um, I, I think that, 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 that actually uh, what I have taken away, uh, I think, or carried, or, or that, I, that is in my pocket somewhere, um, is the relationship of deep love, trust, and mutual respect that my parents have for one another. And it was that model of um, a, a faith that wasn't written down. It, it, it's the lived faith that I experienced from both of my parents, which is what I hope I carry forward. And it is um, the positive vision of that's where we're aiming for. Hmm. You know, that's the world that we're aiming for. And um, my, my father, I think, has been really good at articulating that vision of a world which is the world that um, Jeff and Stephanie's daughter um, I will grow up in. Well, and if I could build on that, because in a way, you are the bridge into that world. And just looking at the two of you physically. I look much better. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got, you're wearing some fabulous shoes. Uh, you know, that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ordained minister, as a young a uh, kid once said to me in the slums, you don't look like a CEO. <laughs> you look very different, and I think, and I wonder if it's a deliberate <laughs> bridging mechanism, because we're in a world where, on the one hand, we see religion solidifying, getting more extreme in many cases, and in another part of the world, religion fading. Mm. And how do you see your role as bridging the two, if you do it all? Mm. I don't know that I have thought of myself as, as that kind of a bridge, um, but I hope that, um, that, that, it, that the, the bridge is the um, lived, expression of my parents' legacy um, modeled in, in a sense, um, in a way that is, that, that makes sense for a new generation. Um, so, I, you know, I think I, 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 I thought very deliberately about how I dressed as a clergy person because I didn't want the young, people in the congregation to go, oh, you know, if you have to be a priest, you have to look like that, and I don't want to wear that. And, you know, so there's no place for me in ordained ministry. Um, and to be able to say that actually, no, God wants all of who you are um, to be God's minister in the world. And in, in addition to the dress, this idea that God wants you to be all of who you are. What else have you had to let go? Ah, oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I, 
I don't. I don't think I ever actually had any certainty except that God exists and God loves me. And though that, that is for sure. God may not be interested in me in, at any given moment, but God loves me. Um, and everything else is um, impermanent. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks. And Zach, you got to a moment where you decided that despite a growing up in a family that was deeply wedded to Islam, your mother being more spiritually connected, your father ideologically at the end, you decided you did not even believe in God. And yet you say belief is a choice and that even those who are raised to hate can choose another path. Could you talk a little bit about that choice for you and how you see us helping others make that choice or not? Sure, well, uh, first I just want to say that it's an absolute privilege to be here and to be sharing the stage with all of you. Um, you know, for me growing up, I started out from a place that assumed that I already knew everything that I needed to know. Uh, you know, ideologically speaking, I was taught very rigid values about the kinds of people that I should associate with and the kinds of people that were bad influence. And isolation, I think, was one of the most important ingredients in indoctrinating me. Mm. And it wasn't really until I got a little bit older and I started to interact with many of the people that I'd been taught these negative stereotypes about that I got the first inkling of this idea that perhaps what I had been taught wasn't true. And for example, I, um, I was bullied very badly as a kid. And when you're going through something like that, it's terrible and it feels like it's going to last forever. And I didn't realize until I was much older that I gained something incredible from that. And that was a sense of empathy. And I'd been taught for much of my life that Muslims and Jews could not be friends, that they were natural enemies. And I became involved in this program uh, that dealt with youth violence in schools. And it was about a week long. And three days into it, I realized that one of the young men that I was getting pretty close with was Jewish. And, and my first thought was, I actually, I felt a sense of pride because I felt like I had accomplished something that had never been done before. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, and... Which actually and I, said something about you, in, uh, even in and of itself. Sure. Um, and, you know, for the rest of that afternoon, I, I, had my, I held my head high because, I, you know, as I said, I thought I'd done something that had never been done before. And, of course, that's ridiculous. But that was the first instance where I really thought to myself, hmm, you know, was what I was taught the truth? <clears throat> And from that point on, there was this little nugget of uncertainty. And, and I realized, of course, that the ideology in which I was raised is not representative, representative of, of the vast majority of Muslims in the world. Uh, and it may sound strange to say that the actions of my father really didn't have a lot to do with the reason that I left religion. Um, I, began becoming involved in the anti-war movement in the United States when I was still very much a devout Muslim and held on to many of the beliefs that I was raised in, particularly, and this seems to be a theme about mothers, but my mother was instrumental in helping to chip away at, at this ideology that my father had taught me. And she taught me very important lessons, like treat people the way I wanted to be treated, and not to judge a book by its cover. 
And when I realized as I got older and started to recognize the subconscious prejudice that I had towards people because of the way that I had been indoctrinated by my father, mm. I, I knew so vividly what it was like to be victimized by people, particularly because of the bullying, that I, I just decided that I didn't want to make people feel the way I had been made to feel. And uh, the hardest conversation that I've ever had with anyone was telling my mother that I no longer believe in God. Um, but I hope that she takes some solace in knowing that the path that I have chosen uh, is a direct result of the lessons that she taught me. Zach, you use the word ideology and religion in different ways. And you talk about rejecting your father's ideology. And yet, then you leap to, I no longer believe in God. And what was it that made you decide that you no longer believed in God and you st step back from religion? Sure. Uh, you know, for me, it was simply being unable to reconcile religion with human history. Um, you know, people always said that science would disprove religion, but I always thought that it was history that would do that. Um, because if you look at 10,000 years of human history, for example, um, you can see the start of these major religions. And, I, and for me, it was just disbelief in an omnipotent being um, that would create us the way that we are and then judge us for eternity for being that way. Mm. Um, so that was really the reason that I, that I lost my faith. <laughs> And um, given that, are there, are there values from Islam specifically that you are carrying forward in your life? Well, you know, the thing about the way that I view religion is that, uh, you know, with regard to value is you can have someone, you know, I, I've known people who are willing to go to brutal lengths for their version of Islam. Um, and I've known lesbians with tattoos that were also Muslim. And so, you know, I, I think that trying to ascribe any particular value to, um, to a religion is extremely difficult. Mm. Um, for me, you know, I held on to, I suppose the closest that I could say is that I held on to my mother's version of the religion. Um, again, which was to say that in order to make the world a better place, you have to be, uh, you know, it has to start with you. And, and, um, and I always just, I held on to that, and I decided that if the world was going to become a better place, that it had to, it had to start with me, with the individual. Mm, thank you. Ophelia, you grew up with storytellers, the daughter of Roald Dahl, one of the great imaginations of a generation. Um, what was that like for you? What were the beliefs that you inherited? What did you carry forward? You know, I think growing up with, with parents who are creative and imaginative. My sense of my, my upbringing was that it was equal parts imagination and pragmatism. The, to, to have spent time with a father who told you a story every single night and, and dealt you these rather fantastic victory narratives. Um, I remember as an eight-year-old uh, very clearly telling him that I was struggling with math at school and being very worried about it, very anxious. And he convinced me that actually uh, that would be changed by the kind of dream powder that a giant would blow through your window. And <laughs> my, my, my math grades improved. So it, that kind of Even conviction early on that, that, that um, imagination, um, that, that, that can affect a belief system in an, in an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old at the same time he was extraordinarily pragmatic, as was my mother. But he, I remember uh, an idea that just because you're a writer, you're not only a writer. And I think both of my parents believed very strongly that, that the world 
and its con conditions are created by people, and people can change them. And you become socialized in this way that it feels normal for a writer when faced with terrible problems. For example, my younger brother, who was very badly injured as a baby, um, had eight neurological surgeries, um, needed to have a shunt that kept failing um, back in the 60s, kept failing, kept failing, and my father said, there must be a better way, and he set about making partnerships and finding people, and a neurosurgeon and an inventor, and together they made and changed the shunt as it was then, and it was um, use on my brother, and they, it worked beautifully, the three of them, and they gave the patent away to Great Ormond Street, and it was used for some time, many years, as, as a shunt. And growing up with that and realizing that you sort of almost take it for granted that change can take place. So I think that when I was lucky enough to go to Haiti at 18 and meet my greatest friend, Paul Farmer, who's here, and you have that kind of a mentor that's layered onto what I had from my own parents, it's a pretty extraordinary place from which you think that you can actually um, make change. And I, I think that was, that was very powerful for me. And speaking of the, the, the partnership that you and Paul have had um, for 30 years, um, when you, what, what you brought into that and then meeting Paul from a very different background, a different set of structures. What was the interplay for you in building an organization that clearly has the idea of faith defined in, in other people mm. in it, and also has had to move very quickly and have a fluidity in the way yeah. that it has interacted with the world? How, how has he impacted you? How have you impacted him? What is this relationship? Well, I think, I'm, am I get, well, speaking, I can't speak for him, but I would say that he has, he has impacted me enormously, as has his, his faith and his belief that, a belief that um, the world does not need to be as it is, that uh, inequality is not inevitable. And I think that when you marry all of these things and you meet someone who, although had an entirely different uh, early life than me, um, you, 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 you bring what he ca comes with um, into this work, and that is the power to harness great vision, huge imagination, fantastic as aspirations to many different partners, and this idea that both of us, I think, would agree that we've learned an enormous amount from the people that we've worked with over the years, that both of us although we're sort of socialized for success in different ways, it wasn't until we went to Haiti and met our colleagues there that we, we learned on the job um, in proximity to those people who, who told us what it was that was needed, how their lives wanted to be changed, and, and, um, and seeing how we could use that, that important muscle and training of success to be able to take that and say, Different standards need to be adopted. We must bring what it is that's needed and, and show how change can be made. I think, I think you know, I, I feel like it's, it was a good partnership. It still is a good partnership. Very, uh, in some ways, different styles. Just as with our other colleagues um, and mm. partners, Jim Kim and Tom White and Todd McCormick, you have all of these things that come together and you don't sit on a hillside and say, I think this is going to be too difficult. I think it's too hard. You come in with this sort of, you know, almost uh, uh, this sort of great confidence that something can be done and must be done. And when you look at Partners in Health played a, a real role in the, the whole Ebola crisis, which is a, a whole case study in what we believe about each other and where it helps us and where it gets in our way. Mm. When you look at the challenges we face today as a world, um, partners in health's role in it, and what we have to believe to make the kind of change that we need to make in healthcare going forward, what, what do you see? I, see? I see enormous progress. When I look back, back, I see enormous progress and tremendous transformation. I think that one of the things that you're lucky 
if you, if you live long enough to be able to look back and see what's been done, I think that there's no question that getting to see, for example, young men who are now fully trained doctors who were born into poverty because there's a, a, a real belief that building systems of health and education and raising standards is one of the most important things that, that you can do. I would say that that, that is a, a key part and very connected to the Ebola response and the needs in West Africa, which is that the key is going to be, must be, building systems, not a few, um, a few interventions here and there. It's really the long, long commitment to changing systems that have been around for a very long time or affected by war, and colonialism, and all of these kinds of things. I think it's, it's looking and making sure that, you're, that, you, that the excitement is in the investment, seeing the change mm. over the long, long time. And that's, that's what I feel lucky enough to be able to, to see. And, and growth. I mean, we were chatting a little bit earlier about, uh, about what one, some of the things that you, you, know, you might have to leave behind. And I think that, for me, the idea of what one would leave behind is the idea that small is somehow beautiful in the face of great need in the world. I think it's very difficult to grow and expand, um, especially when your organization is really lovely and cozy and you love everybody you work with. Um, it's hard to grow, but I would say that's the, that's, that's the thing you have to say, that in spite of how difficult this is going to be and how many challenges we'll face and how much you'll get wrong and how much criticism, you have to grow. Because not to grow, to quote our great friend and mentor and uh, instigator in many ways, Tom White, is a sin, you know? If you have, if you have what it takes and you know how to grow, the need is enormous, and you've got those ingredients, and you know what the recipe is. You have to grow, and you have to bring other people with you. So the courage of what we leave behind. Small is beautiful, but scale is critical. It's a good, it's a good thing to think about. Archbishop Tutu, I can't end without um, asking um, a question around your, your wisdom. I mentioned to you that in 1998, I um, I had the privilege of sitting at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, a couple of days after a colleague of mine was murdered by the FARC in Colombia. And you sat with myself and a, a group of colleagues um, at a moment of deep grief. And what you said to us was that people yearn to be good. And you were so filled with grace at the end of this long, long day that I have wondered and continue to wonder where you find that seemingly endless reservoir of grace and what has sustained you through the dark times, even if, as Ophelia says, you've seen a much larger swath of this moral arc of justice. There have been really difficult times. And for those in Nairobi or in Kenya and Pakistan, and um, Nigeria, places of terrorism, what sustains? Uh, I, I believe very fervently that um, <laughs> I, w I would not be able to make it on my own. I, I believe so very fervently that I am, as all of us are, upheld by the love and the prayers and the caring of others. Mm. Um, I. I was in New York one day, and I met up with uh, someone who was a solitary. At the time, she was a solitary in um, California. 
and I said, please just describe a, a, one of your days. How, what is it like? And she said, well, my day starts at two in the morning. And here in the woods in California, I pray for you. And I said, wow. I'm being prayed for by name in the woods in California at two in the morning. <laughs> what chance does the apartheid government stand? And so I, I know, and it's not, I'm, I'm not naturally modest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's so fantastic to belong in this community, this fellowship of remarkable people mm. who uphold you. I mean, you know, I, I, in those bad old days, the South African Broadcasting Corporation delighted in tripping you up in, in, in interviews. And I would get a trick question and I have to say, I was quite surprised at the answers I gave. <laughs> that me. And, and it clearly wasn't. It was that, that old lady there, faithfully going to the Eucharist and saying, God, Help that big-nosed guy. <laughs> and so that big-nosed guy becomes quite smarter than he would otherwise have been. <laughs> and, and I give great thanks for all the people around the world who have upheld us. No, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, <laughs> even if we tried until we were blue in the face. We wouldn't be free today had it not been for this fantastic bunch of people around the world mm. who supported us in the anti-apartheid struggle. And there were those who said, yes, please, God, help him, and God, help me. Well, I could, like Mabel, could talk to you all, all night. It is such a deep, deep privilege to be on the stage with each of you. Um, I have studied you and learned about the remarkable things that you do, but more important, the way that you are in the world. You really walk with not just humility, but a deep and abiding belief that we can find this shared framework, this common ground. We may have to think differently about the future, but each of you represent the best of the past and the promise of the future in extraordinary ways. And, um, I'm sure everybody joins me in just feeling that this is really a blessing. Thank you. Thanks, Zach.
probably not breaking any secrets to tell you that there were tears backstage. And thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Ophelia. Thank you, Mbo. Thank you, Zach. And thank you, Arch. Endless reservoirs of grace. Can we applaud that one more time? OK, now it's music time. Masukas come from northern Mozambique. They are musician activists, or they're activist musicians. Or, I think as they would prefer it, they are both. Their songs are not incidentally about social issues. They are explicitly and centrally about social issues. Um, and we'd like to show you a very short film before we hear them. I hope you enjoy this, and I know you will enjoy them. <laughs> On the other side of the world, far away from modern life, lies a vast expanse of land called Nyasa. This is Mozambique's most northern province. But in a small village up the road, there's excitement in the air. A crowd is gathering. Everyone has come to see this man, Feliciano dos Santos. He's one of Mozambique's best known musicians. And he's turned up here to play with his band, Masukos. Boa tarde. If everyone looks a little bewildered, it's for good reason. They've never seen a rock band before, but they recognize Santos as one of their own. He was born and raised in Niassa and sings in the local tribal language. This is their most popular song, and it's a little unusual. That's right, Santos is singing about toilets. He's not your typical rock star. He uses his music to teach villagers about good hygiene. Since their inception, Feliciano and Masukos signed a record deal with the British label and have played to massive audiences outside of Africa. Samal Fontes is the lead singer in their band, and he and Santos work together in the Estamos office. It's a unique combination. They're nonprofit health workers by day, Afro pop stars by night. Yeah. 
I would like to say some words. Um, thank you for Skoll Foundation to invite Masuk to play this, this forum. But also I would like to say a few words to our mother, Gracia Bashel. We know that she's here. She's just a seat here. Please stand up, please. I know that she remembered that she helped a lot as when we start this band. She helped a lot. And thank you, mother. Thank you. Shawing, 
as I promised, that was wonderful. Thank you, Masukos. Um, I'm officially banned uh, by my daughters from using words like vibe. So <laughs> I will simply say that Masukos have put me in the mood for the forum. Uh, and if we're very good, um, I'm told that we will hear them again on Friday. <laughs> now, an event like this can't happen without the support of a huge number of people. Um, at the Skoll Foundation, at the Skoll Center, at the Said Business School, at Caspian, here on the production crew, and as a result of all your efforts everywhere, always. So thank you. <laughs> and I'd like to acknowledge, um, in particular, um, the help we get from City. Thank you, Bob and Ibele and Graham McMillan and your team. Thank you. And thank you, MasterCard Foundation. They allow us to bring 12 young social entrepreneurs to the forum. And those people enrich this event. And now, and now, you will be relieved to hear, you will get very little more from me, but dinner is upon us. And your badges will show you where your dinner is, and helpful people will direct you as you leave this building. But before you go to your dinner, I ask only one thing of you. I ask you to believe six impossible things before dinner. And I ask that your work this week makes those things possible. Enjoy your forum.